Thank you all for coming to our next in the lineup of Red Pill Talks. We are here with uh, an amazing cast of people. First of all, let me just thank Marissa for uh, producing this and, and coming up with this idea um, and supporting us as artists as we are in this crazy time that we're in <laughs> with Broadway being closed until May of 2021. Here we go, buckle up. Okay, but here we are. We are with some incredible creators, first and foremost of which is Tanya Pinkins, who has won just about every kind of award you could possibly win. A Tony Drama Desk, Clarence Derwin, OB Monarch, Lucille Lortel, LA Drama, Critics Circle, Audience Choice Award, all of the things, and been nominated a million times for everything else. She's also a brilliant, brilliant um, activist and uh, speaker, and she's created so many opportunities for people. And now she's making this incredible socio-political horror film called Red Pill, which we will talk about just shortly but i want you all also to know about the incredible guest artists that we have on today first is megan miller she's an american soprano with an active international career in opera recital and concert um she's also been featured in the met operas i don't know how to say anything in german but <laughs> de frau ona schatten okay <laughs> okay so Megan's the classiest person here and she knows lots of languages and, and it's great. She's <laughs> amazing. Um, we're very lucky to have you. Thank you for joining us. And we also have, of course, Jay Armstrong Johnson, who is a stage and screen star known for his role on Quantico, as well as his turns in uh, Broadway shows Phantom of the Opera and On the Town, as well as his, and I think maybe my favorite, um, star turn is Anthony and PBS is Sweeney Todd. I loved you and that. Oh, the silky tones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I also just found out that Jay is creating a film. He's in, he's making his own film as well. Um, it's a visual Halloween album uh, benefiting Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Um, will you tell us a little bit about that, Jay? Yeah, um, first of all, I'm <laughs> super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, these discussions are so important. Um, but every year I've been doing a Halloween cabaret downtown in the West Village, um, and this year is our fifth anniversary, and we were teaming up with Broadway Cares to make it a Halloween uh, event, their annual Halloween uh, fundraising event. And when COVID hit, we decided to turn our energies to the internet. And so we are creating a visual album, translating our live cabaret into a film. So think Beyonce's Lemonade with a little Hocus Pocus twist. But it's really fun. Oh, uh, we love Hocus Pocus. Okay, and you said that people can go to blackflamecandle.net in order to watch it? Oh yeah, um, it'll be all over my socials. It'll be all over Broadway Cares, Equity Fights Aid socials. Um, and we launched the film on October 29th and it should be on the internet for a while so donate to broadway cares and watch some really genius artists do some pretty brilliant work yes 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 um broadway cares as well as actors fund um there's lots of organizations out there that are helping actors during this time i know we all are in similar boats with each other and and employment and unemployment and all the things um but it is pretty substantial the amount of people who are uh, impacted and really not able to, uh, unless you're doing everything online, which, you know, we're all working on, but the uh, Broadway community is definitely struggling. And since we're not coming back until May of 2021, at the very earliest, um, we're in for the long haul. But okay, I wanted to try something a little bit different today. We haven't done this before, but um, I love that we have these incredible people joining us who are so intelligent and have such interesting perspectives, people that you know and love and who are very talented, and of course, Tanya and all of the things. So um, I love that we're having these conversations. Like you said, Jay, they're very important. And I just wanna like create just a little bit of a space with everybody here. So if you would, you can join me, you cannot. It's open, you're allowed to do whatever you want on here. It's your money. Um, <laughs> but um, I just invite you to close your eyes for a second and uh, just take a deep breath in through your nose. Release it out through your mouth. Let's do that a couple more times. Deep breath in through your nose. And release it out through your mouth. One more time, in through your nose. And out through your mouth. 
great. Thank you so much. I love to just center that way with anything that I do, but especially when we're going to dive in and talk about topics that can be, you know, hot button, red pill topics. <laughs> so Tanya, why don't we talk a little bit about this film? Um, we're in the month of Halloween. We're in the horror month, I guess you could call it. <laughs> it is also my birth month. So sometimes a, a, October 19th is my birthday. Libra. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I'm not I'm not a huge horror film buff. I definitely love horror films that have um, a story and are saying something, which I think is definitely what you're accomplishing, Tanya. So why don't you tell everybody um, a little bit about the film? Um, so it's called Red Pill. And Red Pill has a lot of different meanings in the world. And uh, the log line of it is the eve of the 2020 election, a posse of progressives ride into red country armed with heart, humor, and naivete. They should have brought heavy artillery. And <laughs> um, it's really about the kind of the blue red divide. And um, <clears throat> I find sometimes that I feel much more in touch with America, the America that is America, than a lot of the people in the cities. And so some of my ideas about what's going on in my world, um, you know, living in New York City, people kind of always treated me with a little bit of contempt and like I had two heads. But I was very clear that um, our current president would win and had felt pretty clear that, um, that, that he was going to get reelected as well. And so instead of even discussing that with people who were like, what a ridiculous, you know, how stupid of you, never. Um, I decided to just take my thoughts and ideas and create something funny and scary and entertaining. And we shot last Halloween. That was our, the, the beginning of our shooting was last Halloween. And the movie itself and story starts on Halloween. And um, at the time that I wrote it, uh, when people were reading it, they were like, that is so far-fetched. And now the plot of the movie is just everyday news. <laughs> so it's kind of like, okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to get it out. I'm here in Seoul, Korea, working with an amazing editor and the South Koreans do horror like nobody. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're just now been sharing it, sharing cuts of it with people and really fascinating the way the um, response to it falls along uh, gender, race, and, and um, cultural lines. What people like, what people find boring, what people find interesting, really specifically relates to their position in the American hierarchy. Hmm. So um, I'm learning a lot about how to take critique and how to um, really know when something needs to stay because even though it doesn't resonate with this particular audience it's going to resonate with that audience over there or another audience over there so that's been a big part of the learning process as we've been sharing cuts with people mm -hmm. do you feel like when you were creating this as opposed to now when you first created it did you think this is my audience and now that you've gotten it to this point are you like oh okay I thought that was my audience, but it's actually this this thing, and I want it to be this, or it feel, you know what I mean? Do you feel like you have a specific understanding of who the audience you want it to be? I think I, I always knew that it was gonna um, split people, that it was gonna be kind of like Get Out, where people were gonna see different movies. Um, mm. It is definitely a Black woman's perspective, and uh, I'm part of a Black woman filmmaker co collective, and it's, you know, it's some of the top people in the world actually. And what's fascinating is listening to these uh, people talk about how some shows that I love, they start tearing it apart from their perspective being in the room and saying, you know, they bring us in the room to, because they say they want a diverse voice and then they actually don't want our voice. It's mm -hmm. like from the perspective of all these um, black creatives all of 
the this creativity that we get out of Hollywood is get out. They've put um, white skin, you know, black skins on white perspectives. So there was mm-hmm. kind of nothing that um, this group found was 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 really, you know, um, sacred in the sense that they really honored all of the arguments that the mm. black women creatives wanted. And so so far, um, the the black women who've looked at this have been like, yes, that's me. I know that's how I feel. That's what my life is like. And what that really means is nobody's listening to the black woman. She's telling everybody there's a problem, and yeah. everybody's like, yeah, yeah, shut up, yeah, you, you, yeah, uh huh. You're so extreme. You're so extreme. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I knew that it would be something that that black women would relate to. Interesting. I I also found when I was making my short film and still in the process of making it, um, but as I was showing a lot of my white male writer friends the script, they were very confused. (laughs) And then anytime I showed it to a person of color and especially a woman of color, she was like, oh, I cried. It was all the things. And I was like, "I, I actually didn't And I think that's me coming from a place of being mixed and also having light skin privilege and being in spaces with white people so often. I I really honestly was like, no, like I relate to you guys so much. Like you must be able to relate to what I've gone through and been through. Like I literally had a little bit of a blinder on and I was like, after showing it to different audiences, I was like, oh no, you don't see my experience or my perspective at all. And, you know, and obviously this is, these are microcosms of macro issues and things like that. And this is anecdotal, but I I was like that, that really did stick out to me that there is this divide of experience of, you know, even just our country, it's like black people experience it a different way than white people do and women versus men and gay people versus straight people and trans versus, you know, like, it's almost like living in completely separate realities. It's not as if like, yeah, things are a bit different or I like things a little differently or prefer things. It's like a different world, <laughs> which is, it's interesting and, and a little scary, I think, um, which I think we're all in this place now where we're coming to grips with how different things are for everyone. And I was wondering if Jay and Megan, if you guys want to chime in now, like what, what are you sensing? What's the sense that you're getting? Do you feel like the divides are growing? Do you feel like they're coming to light? Do you feel like there's a chance to bridge them now finally because we're talking about it? Like what's what's your sense you're getting? Well, for me, I have a lot of questions. You know, there was a lot of discussion during the Obama era, era, lancing the boil and let everything out you know all these hidden things that were under the surface are coming out but i'm not sure if we should see it that way i i wonder if you know every bit of ugly discourse that happens doesn't lead to more emboldening of more discourse Mm -hmm. you know so is it more like neuroplasticity where we you know every time you do something you become better at doing it and you become Mm -hmm. less afraid to do it so then if you get to spew your horrifying hate all the time mm-hmm. and other people hear it and feel comfortable doing the same, does it become then how we all are? Mm-hmm. And does that become our habit and our level or uh, is it very healthy to have this disco- discussion all the time um, and really know what people are thinking? I mean, my par- part of me says like, we have to know the truth first we can't have the silent majority, supposedly, where people are all afraid to vote, uh, yeah. afraid to talk about their vote, but then do what they want in the polls mm-hmm. um, or only among trusted friends, you know, and then have a different face for everyone else. I have questions. I don't have the answer to that one, but I have a lot of questions I'm observing with concern, mm-hmm. but then also, you know, when someone really tells me the truth, at least I feel like I know where they are. Right. I think a hidden truth is is more dangerous than, you know, which I, it kind of goes back to, I think it was Martin Luther King. He was like, you know, the KKK scares me less than the moderate, the white moderate, right? The person Agreed. that I don't really know where they stand, at least right. with KKK, I know what, right. what they stand for and I can uh, plan accordingly. But for the person that is underneath the surface and not really telling like, you know, nice to my face, but you know, nobody likes that. <laughs> that's, that's disconcerting. That's, I don't know how to deal with that. That's confusing. Well, and it's I dangerous. Like 
with with you, Megan, I feel like the challenge is not that we would say what we say. I think the challenge is we have technology that actually magnifies and elevates the ugliest. Um, yes. I don't know if you're watching The Social Dilemma and Agents of Chaos, but the algorithm actually is magnifying the worst in us because it finds that it keeps people engaged with the platform. So I think we do have to consider that because of the fact that this technology is, is doing that. It is going for the ugly and the dark and making it appear to be much more than it is. Well, yes, and I also know that advertising dollars these days are always going to the deepest connectors with certain topics. It's not the majority voice. It's the right. people who are most crazily involved that get under that get supported. Yes, yeah. Jay, what, what are your thoughts? Um, coming from it, uh, from an artist's perspective, it's like, okay, well, what am I doing? What art am I creating? Because I. I feel like all of the education I've put myself since quarantine has started and <laughs> since Black Lives Matter has really come to the forefront, I, I thought that I was this woke-ass white guy. <laughs> and I realized that, no, I was actually born in the South and I was raised by a bunch of racists. Um, and I have very deeply rooted racist ideals and ideas um, in me. And reading books and educating myself has made me say, okay, I was given this platform by Broadway. I was given this platform by ABC and Quantico. How can I use my voice with my 40 something thousand followers to then create change, to then to be a part of change, to start those hard conversations, to challenge my friends and my family that don't think that the Black Lives Matter movement is legitimate, you know? So it, it's, a, it's this idea of the media and we as artists are a part of that media and how the Black narrative has been given to us by the media since the earliest part of American media has been so twisted. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I've learned a, a lot of that by watching things like 13th and mm -hmm. reading the books like white fragility and uh, like truly understanding what it mm -hmm. means to have and uh, have white privilege so uh, that's kind of where i am now um this idea of the pendulum swinging so far this way i mean i can't tell you how many times my agents have told me, no, you aren't getting that role. It's going ethnic. And so that was just something that I heard over and over and over again for the last five or six years of my career. And so that was the rhetoric that I used with friends, which I didn't even know that that kind of rhetoric was actually hurting my friends of color because they're mm -hmm. saying, oh, OK, so then me getting the role the reason is because of this. Can you reframe that for me? So I'm actually realizing that this rhetoric I've been fed by my agents and by the industry and by the arts as a whole is actually not, it's actually hurting the cause that we think is actually trying to be helping. So it's, mm. I'm confused right now and I'm trying my best to do what I can with what I have to keep myself informed and to like challenge the friends and family that I grew up with in the deep fucking South. <laughs> yes. Hey, let me ask you this, Jay, um, because, you know, right now we have a president who says that to talk about slavery is child abuse. Um, do you feel that this new education and awareness is harming you in any way? Absolutely not. It's making me uncomfortable for sure. Um, I, I am on edge more than I have been ever when it comes to these kinds of conversations. But maybe that's what the Black experience has been for 400 years. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like all of a sudden I can have some empathy because I am the one that's uncomfortable now as opposed to an entire race of humans that have made themselves uncomfortable for my comfort. You know, it's it's... It's not hurting me by any means, but it is absolutely challenging me and making me deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> well, we appreciate you diving into the uncomfortable gray area that is learning something new. I mean, even just like a new skill, it's hard as an adult person to like learn a new thing and like right. not be great at it at first, right? And totally. then you add in the fact that we're in this moment that we're in with 
the president and with you know black lives matter and with the pandemic you add all of those social aspects on top of it and also like cancel culture and you know all of the other things that to be wary of and afraid of i suppose you know um, what the repercussions are of being incorrect and which is why i think you know we're having these conversations here it's like how how else are you going to know what is or isn't unless you go out there and you have the conversations, right? And I I hope that, you know, with things like this and, and just in general, like my hope with the conversations is that if we have them in a productive way with boundaries and goals in mind, <laughs> then instead of us practicing being the worst thing, right, we might just open up potentialities for being a better thing, if that makes sense. And I want to say that like one of the things also in getting feedback on um, Red Pill is that um, I'm I'm so used to being uncomfortable that that's just a kind of normal place. So like there's a place in the movie, there's a, a people are talking about their baby and whether it's gonna be a boy or a girl and someone says, well, it might be a they. And there's like, oh my God, that's right. It might be a they. And <laughs> a bit of criticism that I got about it was like, you know, you're laughing when you say it might be a they and that might offend trans people. And I'm like, okay, I can take them being offended and coming to me and talking to me about it. The point for me is that they're included. We're including that that is another perspective. So I'm not going to, I think for that person, they would have cut that out because of the risk of the confrontation, the discomfort of the confrontation. And I'm like, no, I'm going to risk the confrontation because for me, I just want to include that perspective. And for these group of people, they is new for them. So it is like, whoa, a they, that's right. We might have a they child, you know? And I think I think that's the beauty of storytelling, right? It's not that we are at every moment going to be 100% PC or 100%, you know, including everyone and 100% diverse and 100, like that that is impossible and also not realistic, uh, like a, not a realistic representation of what we experience in our everyday lives. We're telling stories about real human beings generally or fantastical ones, but they have a basis in real humanity, right? Our core, uh, the things that really are our core and, you know, fear and sadness and anger and all those things. And on top of those things are the circumstances of people's upbringing, right? Like Jay said, like he came from a specific place and that informed some of his behavior and some of his thought patterns and some of the, you know, same for all of us. We've all been informed by that and also the way that the world sees us. So if we just start taking everything away and not, not ever risking anything or not ever just showing a part of the world that might not be the best or whatever, how boring is that going to be? <laughs> right? Like, we're trying to we're trying to actually show all of the things and then we can have conversations about it. That's yeah. That's a story to me that I'm interested in. It's something that makes us ask questions and want to talk to each other about it. But as we've said, talking in, in this time period has been difficult, especially with the al algorithms making it so difficult just to even reach the people that you want to reach and, and talk to the people that you want to talk to. So um, one way that we use their voices is, of course, voting. <laughs> and I want to talk about this. Um, you know, as we spoke a little bit before, Jay and Megan, we were talking about the things that we're concerned about and, and voting was one of those things. Um, we want to be able to use our voices, but if we're yelling into an empty void or yelling into a, an echo chamber or we're, you know, how do we know if we're really making any kind of impact? Um, and is it important to always make an impact with your voice or can you just use it and, and know that you've used it. I don't know. So uh, Megan and Jay, I want to get your thoughts on, you know, what are your concerns around voting and the process and the usage of our voices? I'm very concerned right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I talk to friends and family, you know, there's just, there's so many different types of propaganda <laughs> coming to them about, you know, how they have to vote, you know, I'm going to go stand in that line. And even if I catch COVID, it's going to be worth it. You know, it's like, you don't have to be so afraid. You could use the mail-in system and you can trust it. You know, don't let all of this worry that has suddenly been created, hmm. um, you know, disenfranchise you. And I, I think 
it's pretty clear actually that our elections have been functional beforehand to some degree because the amount of work going on to dismantle it means actually that our votes do count. And that's what I've been trying to tell people. If they're working so hard to make us so afraid, then it actually must be power that we have. Mm. But I think a lot of people are believing it. And I think a lot of people, um, I want people feeling disgust for the process. I worry about people throwing up their hands about who the candidates are, um, thinking it's not worth it to expose themselves in one way or another, either to intimidation or to the sickness or even just the, the inconvenience or that they might mess up with their ballots. Sure. Do I even try? Sure. What do I know? I don't have time for this. Mm. You know, and, and I know that there have been a lot of things, I think I mentioned in our discussion, I'm in Pennsylvania right now. That's where I grew up, my father's home is here. And, um, you know, just in order to get my license renewed, my driver's license, I had to produce my original social security card. And it's such a barrier to do. <laughs> and in order to do that, I actually had to go to a couple of different agencies. I had to pay some money. I had to ask about it. I had to have internet access. I had to have the desire and ability to do it. I had to have a car and someone to drive me because my license was expired. <laughs> you know, right. it was a huge thing. And I just think to myself, wow. Uh, and because I haven't voted here in an election before, I voted other places in previous elections, I'm going to have to show ID in this state to do it. So this is on its face discriminatory. There are so many blockades. And this is one of the easier states in which to vote. Mm -hmm. So it makes me furious. <laughs> and, um, and I kind of want to scream from a mountaintop that, you know, everyone just go do it. Like if, if they're trying this hard to suppress your voice, then mm. it means you have to scream louder. Mm. I, you know, I was doing a little research on compulsory voting. Yeah. Um, Cause I, the, the truth is, I feel like the best question is, if if you weren't worried about everyone voting, like if you really cared about democracy and you wanted everyone's voice to be heard, right, then you would just automatically register any 18 year old to vote, right? Like it would just be an automatic, as soon as you become an adult and you're, you're eligible to vote, you would just become registered and you would do it. There are also, you know, there's more that goes into compulsory voting of like, you have to do it. And if you don't do it for four elect, like in Belgium, if you don't do it for four elections, then you could be not able to vote for 10 years and you get a fine or whatever it is, but you have to at least show up. And with that are, you know, other um, things that make it easier, like it's a national holiday and you know what I mean? So everyone gets off of work. So work is not something, a barrier because who can take off work just randomly all the time, you know, or if you do vote, you get a, you get a voucher in some countries so that you can say, okay, I voted and now I can take off of work whatever your job is, I can take off of work one day with this voucher because I voted, which is pretty cool. I mean, I, I feel like if that system got implemented, we would have everybody voting, right? But you're assuming that it, there was an intention for people to vote. It wasn't. Exactly. You know, Pence said it at the last um, debate. This is not a democracy. It, mm -hmm. It's a republic. And at the time of the constitution, people who owned slaves got to vote, you know, if you had 180 slaves, you got to vote a hundred times because they counted as three fifths of a person. That vote didn't go to the slave, it went to the owner. So that mm -hmm. person got to vote 100 times because mm -hmm. of their ownership of other human beings. Mm -hmm. So the system itself was designed to help a very privileged group of people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, also, speaking of the debate, do y'all see that fly? <laughs> <laughs> I just had to say it. I had to say it. All the memes that immediately came out after that and the fact that Biden had, uh, uh, what is it? Something against fly the flies. Or fly fly swatted. Swatted. Like, <laughs> It was, it was, I also just saw something today um, and I have a, a deep love for Obama, not a perfect man by any means, but have a deep love and respect. Um, he was in an interview and a fly kept landing on him. And so he stopped the interview and he mm, killed it on himself, <laughs> mm, smacked it off. Right. But he wasn't going to let a fly just walk around on him. Like, that's <laughs> all I'm saying. Okay. Obama didn't do it. <laughs> he was clearly alive 
and felt things. <laughs> That's all I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Like, right? Like, I don't is see the undead. I don't know. It's October. <laughs> Weirder things have happened this year. <laughs> Is he the undead? <laughs> I don't, you know what I'm saying? Um, okay. <laughs> so yes, I just getting back to voting for two seconds. There are absolutely a lot of blocks to it. And like my mom and I actually, we both got uh, ballots. One, I, I always do absentee because um, I never know where I'm going to be. And I still vote in Pennsylvania. And sometimes I live in New York. And sometimes I live in LA. And sometimes I live in Vancouver. Who knows? Um, so I got absentee. My mom got mail in. We filled them out and we sat there and we checked each other's things just to make sure, like, did I sign everything? Is everything good? Like, double, triple check. Make sure that we put it in the secrecy envelope because that's a big thing, too. I guess people forget and send in naked ballots and they get <sighs> squashed. So don't do that. Tell your friends. Um, <laughs> but after we did that, we actually just took it in person just to make sure just to drop it off. And it's so great. And PA, I don't know if this is true everywhere, but in PA, uh, we get an email saying your ballot has been received and recorded and it's all good. So I don't have to sit here like wondering, but I was like refreshing every day to be like, when are they going to send it? When are they sending it? Send it already. <laughs> Because I, I I feel also that that pressure and nervousness of I want to make sure that it gets in there, right? I don't, we've heard all this talk about the USPS, they were attacking it, clearly, 150% attacking it, trying to dismantle it so that it wasn't able to do the job necessary in order to have everybody's voices heard. So I feel that. Um, another thing, so I wanted to kind of go back around to um, just kind of, again, the divide and um, where we all sit on it. So ta Jay had talked a little bit about his um, background. And again, I thank you for sharing all of that um, about, you know, Southern conservative, um, I think Christian, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tanya, are there people in your movie that represent that um, demographic? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I think that was the fun for me is that I wanted to, if I didn't have a character that did it, I wanted to mention as many groups as possible. Now my my editor is 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 a South Korean and she was like, where's the Asian person in my movie? I was like, oh, I didn't do it. You know, I really <laughs> <laughs> people in my movie. <clears throat> yes, yes. Um, so, okay, here's my question though. You probably can't tell me. Are they the good guy or the bad guy? Are they mentioned in any way that would put them on one side or the other? Um, I guess I don't look at the world and good and bad. Mm. Um, and I tried not to make a judgment of the people in my storytelling. Mm. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it would be really up to you. And honestly, I feel like very much this story was my attack on progressives. <laughs> just me going come on progressives like y'all are ineffective and mm. you know really that's what I made it for to say uh you're delusional <laughs> and ineffective <laughs> mm -hmm. the cancel culture nature around what the progressives are doing I think is detrimental to finding a middle <laughs> ground I mean like a friend of mine has been pretty much canceled because of some things that he said and did in the past and he's he's aware of it and he's doing everything that he can to educate himself and to fight back what he's done and i've been called out for some racist rhetoric of mine online and thank god it's not gotten as much media coverage as my friends has but it's um i think we uh i'm trying to hold space for those that have made mistakes and not cancel them and give them the opportunity you know the christian thing to do the forgiveness thing the uh, the come back into the fold thing that we are taught as Christians um, to do. Uh, so I'm finding myself uh, really, uh, I'm being, uh, <laughs> being challenged really hard right now with cancel culture. <laughs> I agree with you completely. I think it's just not so smart. I mean, if anything, it can recruit for the other side. You know, mm. it's like, well, those people don't embrace me. You know, look what they did to me. They're not as nice as they say. Maybe I need to look at other other groups of people to support me. Right. So mm -hmm. then, you know, what are we doing exactly? 
Right. And we are communal beings. We are created that way. It's in our biology. We are not islands. We, even if we wanted to be, there's no way in our society, unless you lived completely off grid and was self-sustainable in your own little space, <laughs> like you are going to affect other human beings, right? Everything that you do is going to do that. Tanya, I see well, you. I, I, I'm not asking anybody how they're voting, but I like to point this out a lot. Um, because I think it's a fact that most people don't know. I didn't know it until I read Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, this year. And it mm. is that since the uh, Johnson signed um, civil rights in 1968, no Democrat has gotten the majority of the white vote in America. Period. Wow. 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 Yes. There's your sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a different idea of what a one issue election is is this really the one issue right that Oof. is that's always an interesting concept to me of like uh, there's one thing in my heart as a christian or as a whoever whatever demographic i'm in that i just like can't abide and so i'm gonna let all this other bad stuff or stuff that i don't agree with come in because of this one issue, right? And Jay, you were just talking about like, practice what you preach and like, what is actually Christian. And I know that you had expressed concern over the kind of what you feel is the false representation of what Christianity is and the, you know, Republican regime. Um, <laughs> can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, what's funny is that my dad is a Trump supporter. He'd voted for him in the last election. And we hopped on the phone the other day and I was like, so um, how are we feeling, dad? Trump has COVID now, huh? And he's like, oh, it's all fake news. I'm like, okay, dad, you're one of the more Christian people that I know. And now you were saying the deliverer of it's all fake news is now fake news. You're going to have to come to terms with that. So are you voting for him now? Is like, who is the fake news? Is, is, is it Fox? Is it, you know, it's, a, it's just, it's the Christian thing has me freaked out. I saw a lovely article that was about um, conservative evangelicals that are pro-life or supporting Biden. And I was like, I'm going to reshare that. I'm going to reach like, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm trying to find anything and everything that is Christian related because I know that I have so many Christian friends and family back home in Texas that will be voting mm -hmm. for Trump because they're holding Bibles in front of churches after they tear gas peaceful protesters, you know? So I'm, I'm trying to find mm -hmm. anything and everything that I can to like convince them that Trump is not the evangelical Christian way. He's sure. simply not. And I was just reading an article this morning about how when Roe v. Wade was passed, none of the Christian and evangelical leaders cared. Their issue had always been Brown v. Board of Education, but that was considered racist. And so after Roe v. Wade, and it wasn't for six years after Roe v. Wade that they actually jumped on pro-life but this article was saying really the issue is integration, but that's not PC. So we can stay on pro-life and that's more PC to be the beard for what we really are upset about. It's wow. an amazing strategy. Amazing. Wow, wow, wow. Oh. That's disconcerting. <laughs> I learned something so important just now. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. Mine, females, friends, family, I, I know a lot of women in my life that have had abortions and they have them to make their lives better and then shit on everyone that has, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. it's the practice what you preach thing. It's the get the abortion yeah. so that your life is not upturned, but then let's talk badly and not support it going forward in life. And that's, it's this. This, this weird disconnect. Yes. But, yeah. but when there is such a dis disconnect, maybe it's time for us, every time we feel that disconnect, maybe look to tear off a beard because then it means <laughs> actually that's not it. Actually right. that's snatching not snatching beards over here. Oh, I like that. I like that. <laughs> okay, Megan. Yes, I like honey. That. Take it off. Um, <laughs> off a beard. Yeah. I like that. That's we need to mean that. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
<laughs> I, uh, you know, when we were talking about this, Jay, just about like, how can conservatives be so on the Republican side, I started doing a little bit of research into it. And, you know, again, it's hard to do any research now, especially using Google. Um, but I did find some books. And I feel like if it's a book, <laughs> like maybe, maybe. Oh. No, I'm going to have to stop you know. because of the Powell Manifesto <laughs> in 1977. Um, I think his name was Alan Powell. He became a judge on the federal judiciary. And he yeah. wrote uh, this manifesto to all of his Republican conservative friends. And what the complaint was that was that American universities were graduating all of these students who were anti-American and that they were anti-Vietnam. And so they said, we have enough money, we have enough power that we must use that to write books that um, promote our values, to make sure that we have a news media that promotes our values, and to, for every book that they write, for every commenter they have, we need to put two out there espousing our values and our point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well... <laughs> We'll take this with a grain of salt then as we do with almost everything these days. But um, I did find it was interesting. I was like, okay, are, are conservative Christians like really mostly for Trump? And what I was finding in my research is that, uh, so it says, while 52% of lower income white conservative Protestants voted Democratic in the 1990s, 90% of lower income Afro-American, which why are we Afro-American? Anyway, Afro-American Protestants did. So the distinction there is that it's white conservative Christians, not conservative Christians because mm. as a whole, right? right. Like the, uh, the race then is the other dividing factor within this demographic because it was 90% one year and then 96 the next year and the white people dropped from 50 to 22% voting for Democrat, right? So that's even another like further divide that's been growing and growing based on race. And to me, that was just interesting because here's an example of people who believe we would think a similar thing, read the same text, essentially, yet politically are super divided, right? So it's yeah, I never... Go ahead, sorry. I never understood why my church was all white people and the church down the street was all black people. It, it really, this like, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his... Like, <laughs> right! The songs I was singing were not matching my experience. So yeah. like that makes complete sense to me. <laughs> Right, right, right. What were you going to say, Megan? Well, I was going to say, like, uh, you know, I don't know how many people you know, because I grew up Catholic, um, and Catholic? how many people do you know that have read the Bible all the way and have actually studied it? It's not a major portion of the believers, right? So then is it about the book or is it about who's talking to them every Sunday? Is it who's talking right. to them every dinner? Right. that they eat around a table. Mm -hmm. it, I think so much is about influences. I think a lot of it's about the television these days and about the internet. You know, it's really just, I don't think it's about the book. I don't think it's about Agreed. the religion at all. I don't think the influences are coming from there. Agreed. I, yeah. Agreed. I mean, I have read that book and, you know, I have people in my family, like I have an aunt that I love who's a Jehovah's Witness and their Bible is very specific. And so I sometimes want her to look at my Bible, but her religion doesn't allow her to read my Bible. <laughs> she can't even look at my Bible to see how I'm getting something different from hers. Wow, wow, wow. Sounds like America. <laughs> like, if you like Trump, you can only like Fox News and you can't get it from CNN. I've had so many people jump in my comments if I repost something from like, NB MSNBC or whatever, and they're like, that's a fake news thing. And I was like, is it the whole network really? Or like, is this one segment maybe have some truth to it? Could you maybe look at it? And they're like, well, I didn't watch it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, could you actually take a second? Do you know what I mean? Like, if we can actually start hearing the other side, we might maybe find that there's more that connects us than not. I don't know. <laughs> 
algorithm that can, it doesn't want to. It doesn't want to. Connect us. I mean, you know, what they're saying is that the algorithm just likes things that make you irritated and annoyed and sort of aggressive. <clears throat> and that's generally the, the negative things. So the algorithm is just trying to keep us posting and attacking and attacking and attacking. And, 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 you know, in a, in one of those documentaries, the people who created that stuff said that they found themselves becoming addicted and that they do not allow their children to use any of the platforms that they participated in making because they realize this addictive quality and this addictive quality to our worst impulse. Hmm. And that there's there's really no guidelines on how social media works or the algorithms work. We haven't gotten to that place yet. Like there's there well, there's really the guideline for the algorithm is what is going to get my third party advertiser more right. attention. No ethical guidelines. <laughs> Like there's no, there's no across the board. Like the government isn't in any way saying like, Hey, because this is overwhelmingly bad for people. I say this, I started thinking this week that capitalism is a God. I don't know if anybody's read Neil Gaiman's American gods, but capitalism no. is a God. And like, I believe all gods are neutral. The God of capitalism doesn't care if you're good or bad or conservative or Baptist or Christian or Muslim. All it cares about is, are you upholding the principles of my religion, which is make more money, extract more money, make more money. So no matter who you are or what you believe or what your gender or what your race, if you're upholding that, then you are upholding capitalism. And I think if anything, capitalism is the religion of America. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. And I have to say, I, I have had a major education since meeting my husband who grew up in communism. And he is always talking about how he thought it was great that they censored everything when he was growing up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, what, what? Censorship is against the arts, you know, and I, I, we have these horrible discussions about it. But in some ways, the the regulation at that time was trying to protect people from these negative impulses. There are other reasons for it. There was a lot of propaganda and we all understand. But he said, listen, you know, the experiences that I had in my life it nourished so many of my positive sides, you know, and I wasn't exposed to any of these things. And he watches the kids going through so many terrible challenges with, the, you know, this irritation and aggression that is nurtured you know, we don't want censorship, but what would those regulations be if we were going to regulate the algorithm? You know, what is what is the opposite of making money the goal? Because that's what capitalism is. So that, like, what's the next system? You know, mm -hmm. is that about morality and who decides? That's the scary Who decides? Part. That's that's really important too. And, and I think, you know, as you were saying, Tanya, about capitalism being a god, it's like, okay, the Christian god, right? Like in the Old Testament, I always find this interesting because I have read the Bible. It's been a minute, but the Old Testament is just so stunningly different than the New Testament. Like in in that the Old Testament, they talk about like the fear of God and in a, a vengeful God and like those kinds of words that I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is like and I guess it depends on your translation as well. But I do remember even when I was younger being taught about you know, this powerful God that he loves you, but he's also going to like send you into the desert for 40 years or whatever. You know what I mean? See, like, and, and like, he's God. Okay. So I guess he should be able to do that. But then it's like, who are we mean God in our political system? Like, are we really saying that any man at all ever or woman or any human in general is infallible enough to be made a God that we don't question them, right? And that we allow them to rule in the way that the fearful, the God that we are to fear should do, right? So it's like the difference between ruling as a fearful God with an iron fist, like, you know, a dictator or an authoritarian or whatever is trying to do, or ruling like Jesus, who did everything by example, right? Yes, he said like, you should or should not do these things. But in general, he was like, I'm showing up I'm physically informed to show you like, this is the example. This is how things should look. This is how things should be. You should be kind to each other. We are including people now, <laughs> you know, like it feels like a, to me, it feels very different, you know? And it's like, are we 
than creating, because I've heard people say like, well, whoever the leader of America is, is chosen by God. And I was like, but there are people, there are religions that believe that. And not only do they believe that, but they believe that the father is, of the house is also an emissary of God. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, he, his word is the law. And so that if you are a poor or an, an addict or something, then you clearly didn't have the right father figure in front of you. And so whatever happened to you, you deserve it because you did not receive the correction that came directly from God through that father figure. Mm. Which I don't, I don't feel matches what we learn in the New Testament of, hey, let me, don't stone this whore. She deserves to live. <laughs> you know, like, don't, don't hurt this person who can't walk or like, you don't, like Jesus's example was very different, I feel like, than maybe what's being glommed onto right now is the concept of like ruling with an iron fist and that there are appointed leaders from God on high. Jay, do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, I think fear mongering is like how the Republican Party thinks they're going to win is if they can mm -hmm. stoke as much fear into the American people that like the Black Lives Matter movement isn't about police. It's actually about they want to come in and tear down your cities. They want to loot and they want to pillage and they're like, <laughs> they're, they're skewing us away from the actual matter that like lives are at stake and that we have a system that is very based on racist ideals. And the white, the white people don't want to do that because the military industrialized complex is a thing that's been going forever. We go into other countries, we loot and we pillage, we mm. kill their people, we take mm. their land, capitalism, you know, it, that's, that's what it's been. And then our soldiers come back onto our own lands and they are uneducated and they've only been taught how to be in battle. And so now they're on our police forces. So they were they were in our other lands raping and pillaging and killing and now they've come back here and the only way that they can survive is to then be on our own streets and instead of protecting and serving they're actually treating our citizens like the enemy <laughs> and so that's that's where we are right now and so yeah. it's just fear stoking it's fear mongering and the mainstream media makes this point of trying to make you afraid of black people for instance we hear more news about gun violence in chicago than any other city chicago is not even in the top 30 most violent cities for gun violence but you get all this news about it because it's a city because it's a predominantly predominantly black city and you hear very little about quote unquote white on white violence violence is a function of who's in your community People rob, kill people that they live near. We are a segregated nation. So 85% of white people are killed by white people because they live in the same community. And because violence by white people against white people or police against white people is not elevated, white people don't realize the danger that police are causing them. They're killing white people too. They're not just killing black people. They're killing white people too. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I just, I just always go back to like <laughs> mass shootings, which like, oh my God, I get like, and now I'm thinking about like, what's the news cycle been like? Have we heard of any recently? Well, what's interesting that's not in the news cycle is that they just disrupted this um, coup this to overthrow state governments. And right. no one just the White House has said anything about that. They were going to no. overthrow state governments. Yeah. Yep house has been silent on that it's unbelievable <laughs> except it's not just like your movie tanya <laughs> it was far-fetched at one point and now it's just actual reality yeah. Woo! all right so <laughs> okay i want to end this on some kind of positive note <laughs> look there are there is massive upheaval right now but I think I always believe that with the upheaval, with the discomfort, with stepping into the gray and into the unknown, into the unknown. Okay, we <laughs> all now have the opportunity to create something better, different, new, whatever you know, or to mend something, or to whatever it is. I think we have that opportunity, or it's coming. It might not come in the nicest way, but it is available to us, perhaps. Um, so. Jay, Megan, do you have any final thoughts? 
what, you know, what helped you not feel overwhelmed, hopeless, helpless, whatever it is in this very crazy, tumultuous time? The only thing that I can do on most days is simply be kind to everyone around me and seek out interactions with people that I have never met before and offer the same. Love that. that actually, I think, will be the most powerful source is just mm. opening my own doors more and more and more and continuing to have interactions that I think help. Yeah, that's it. I love that. Jay? Yeah, uh, that's really great, Megan. <laughs> um, and it's true. And, and you guys have provided that for us here today. I mean, thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Tani. Thank you, Sierra, yeah. for giving us this platform to have these like hard conversations and to, like re really dive deep into what it is to be an American in today's world. Um, I'm just trying to be an artist. And I know that our industry right now is also... Um, being torn apart a bit, um, especially by our black friends that are saying, actually, this hasn't worked and this hasn't worked and this hasn't worked. And um, I'm, I'm trying my best to not only uh, listen, sit back and listen and learn, but then to, to be active. Um, and so uh, instead of giving in to what my family usually does, which is stay quiet and be nice and just sit back and don't do nothing you know uh, that's not that's not getting us anywhere and so um to, to create well it's getting art. us somewhere yeah. i don't know if it's where we want to go <laughs> there you go so, to, to create art and to elevate voices that are underrepresented that's that's where i am that's where my uh, energy is right now and i feel like that that's the only way to go forward um, Marissa and I have had that conversation a lot uh, in the last nine months about what it means to elevate and amplify underrepresented voices. And so that that's my task and it's keeping me positive and it's keeping me um, energized. Fantastic. I, wanna, I did want to say one quick yeah. thing, if that's okay. Um, I, I sat in on um, Stuart K. Robbins had had an amazing webinar um, the other day and he talked about race in America and how a lot of our school systems from the get-go, literally from pre-K <laughs> started just, you know, not, not implementing what really occurred in our history in those textbooks. And he did a really interesting um, thing where he asked us questions and the whole entire webinar would vote on the answers. And you saw just how little people knew. And one of the questions that was, I mean, it, it was very surprising for me was how many U.S. presidents at one point or another had owned a slave. And they gave us a list of numbers. And a lot of people picked one, two, four, and it was really 18. And, and he said, let this show you that everything that you learned, middle school, high school, in your textbooks were coming through those point of views. They were coming through the point of views of people that did it themselves, that did not think that what they were doing was even an issue. They thought this was just the way to life. And one of the questions that I asked Stuart was, well, then what can I do when I send my son, Jesse Daniel, to school? Because right now, of course, I know how to implement non-bias and teach him about microaggression and things that maybe I realized, like Jay said, like there's a lot of things that you don't even realize, right? But when you start opening your eyes even more, it's like, wow, okay, now I can turn this corner. I can recognize this. Now I can teach my son this. But the question is, is what about when they go to school? Who's going to change mm -hmm. these things in the textbooks? Who's going to make sure that when we put our kids in first and second and third grade, when they're a sponge, that we don't have the same type of teachings. And I just thought that that question within itself may just strike a lot of positivity if we can get more parents on board to really be more active in what their child is learning in school. And Stuart gave us a list of textbooks that we can go out and purchase and start implementing when they do go to school. And it's Which, like, okay, well, how many parents have that? How many parents have right, this list of books? Right. And that gets us back to capitalism. 
because <laughs> the largest groups in the nation are purchased by Texas. And so the education we get is the education that has been approved and is purchased in large quantities by the Texas educational system. And in some of the Texas textbooks, they, in some of them, they list the slaves as, you know, assets on a thing. But in some of them, they talk about these happy employees, employees who they don't mention didn't get paid. <laughs> that's not an employee. No, that's not how that works. <laughs> yes. Well, one thing I can say about who is going to change the curriculum, it won't be Bessie DeVos. <laughs> <laughs> So let's get someone new in there, guys. Go that. out and vote. Use your voice. We need it starts with the kids. New. It starts with your school systems. And like, even if you guys like speak to your high school friends or college friends and you guys see something in your textbooks, like say something. My sister's a New Jersey school teacher and she's already reported several things to her commission because she's noticed mm. things in the textbook that shouldn't be there. Like that's where we need to speak up. Right. We need to speak up in the yeah. school system. See something. Yeah. See I also something, say something. Yeah, I also go. wanted to say one thing. You know, I have a very good friend, and he, he's his whole he's from Tennessee, and his whole point of view is, hey, I know that we're all focused on the national election, but most of the changes to regular people's lives happen at the local level. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you know what's going on locally, and yeah. who to choose for local elections? Don't forget that either, because mm -hmm. the most likely changes to the textbooks will be from local government. Your this is very board. true. You can be on your school board if you have a kid in the school system. Yep. Exactly. Get, get active. I love that. And I, I just want to say to uh, Marissa and Jay and Megan, I loved your responses to this question just because there was an active component to each of them. Right. And that is really the difference, I think, that I'm seeing with a lot of um my liberal friends and also just like my white friends who were like, oh, like, I'm not mean. I don't think these things, I don't do these things, but but it's about action. You have to actually participate in the things that you feel or believe or think, right? Or the things that you've learned, you have to participate in them. Like even just saying like, you know, I, I try to be kind to people, but I go outside, what you said is I'm going outside of the people that I normally would interact with because I want to be kind to everyone. I want to be intentional about reaching out to people outside because that's what it takes. We have been intentionally divided in this country, in my opinion, and also facts, but um, we have been intentionally <laughs> divided. And so it's going to take intentional action to mend that divide. So thank you all so much for joining us. This has been a lovely, lovely conversation. Thank you all for coming back. Some of you, I love that. We appreciate you. Um, we will be on again next Saturday at 5 p.m. Who do we got next week, Marissa? Kelly Leung and John Rua. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Come on. It's going to be a really interesting conversation. Look, we do have an Asian person, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> no, stop. I love Telly. I love Telly. Okay. Um, uh, thank you all again, and we will see Thanks. you uh, next week. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. On and talking with us and sharing your lives and stories with us. Thank you, Sierra, and thank you, Marissa. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you. Can't wait to see Bye. Red Pill. Thanks. <laughs> Me too. Bye.